evening, everybody. Hope everybody's having a fantastic Saturday. Your Saturday is comprised of you watching this. Chances are your Saturday did not go quite as well as you had planned. Got a little bit of a lighting situation going on here. Can't tell. Boosted Hemi's in with the arm flex. I like it. <clears throat> Let some folks kind of start to filter in a little bit. So one of the things I wanted to chat about in, and I, I'm kind of taking this chat a little bit more old school than anything else, to be honest with you. Mainly because I've been getting quite a few questions about, you know, just a, a lot of cam questions, a lot of, you know, what headers are the best, you know, a lot of questions that don't really pertain to reality for a lot of folks. And what I mean by that is, look, if you're planning on putting a camshaft, even a set of long tubes on the car, these are not inexpensive endeavors. Long gone are the days of just being able to throw, you know, two, three hundred bucks at one of these cars and actually get anything real. And when I say these cars, I mean these cars that we own, you know, the hot rod that you got sitting in your garage. It could be anything, an old Camaro, you know, an old Mustang, anything along those lines. You know, those cars were pretty detuned or at least neutered by some standard from the factory. Well, modern cars really aren't. I mean, yeah, you can get more out of them with a tune. You know, some little bolt-ons here and there will at least keep you involved in the car. But the reality is that they're pretty well sorted now from the factory. I mean, you're looking at a, you know, a 392 that's making practically 500 horsepower. In fact, by the old SAE standard, not the 1996 standard, which is certified, but by the older standard, the car is making 500 horsepower. And it's just 392 cubic inches. Kind of hard to beat that. You can kind of follow that down path. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about and, and rehash the, the topic because we've got a lot of new subscribers. So thank you all very much. If you're new to the channel, thank you very much for subscribing and hanging out with us. Um, but I know that we've got a lot of new subscribers because there's a lot of you know unfamiliar faces, I should say, names that are throwing these types of questions at me. So I want to put a video that touched on this. And this is perfect timing because... If you ever hang out on the Instagram, you'll know that I just got the reporting another intake, although you can't see anything again because the lighting is ass in here. But you guys know how I work. There you go. So anyway, that's opened up to 85 millimeters. So this is going to be one of the topics. I've got it in as a prop because it's one of the, the more in-depth and it's probably the last in-depth mod that I would ever suggest to somebody to tackle in their garage at home. But again, it's gonna probably entail some amount of downtime because the car is gonna be down while this manifold's going back and forth and all that. But that's basically where we sit now with these cars. There's not a lot that you can do that is small that's gonna make any real difference in how that car actually runs. And what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about horsepower. I don't really want to get into transmission tuning on this chat because first of all, when guys are asking these questions, they're coming at it from an old school mentality. They're coming at it from, you know, the horsepower number is the most important thing here. And I've tried telling folks over and over again, look, with the Mopars, the weird thing, the strangest thing about the Mopars is that you can have modest gains on a dyno, but the car runs so much better once you incorporate that transmission tune. So before I dive into that, I want to hang out with you early birds real quick, see what we got going on here. Dane's checking in saying, I'm here as well. I like it. Slice a holler not to boosted Hemi too. Slice saying hello. Boosted Hemi is saying hello back. Scavenger 1320 saying, what's up, B. Mason? What's up, Scav? Coleone is in. <laughs> Good evening, Professor Mason. Got the arm flex. Scavenger saying, that's why I'm putting all my focus on weight reduction first. Going to see how fast I can get my 1320 with just that and a stock motor. Good plan. Stick with that plan. You'll actually go a lot farther than trying to drag power out of these things. 
So, and then Jess Campos is saying that he's in. So let's talk about the stuff that works. Um, I'm going to talk primarily 392 stuff right now. This basically will blend over into the 57 cars, but I've been getting touched up with a significant, I should say significantly larger number of 392 owners. And quite a few of them have been 1320 owners, which is really cool. I'm not, not to sidebar too far away from this, but as my, you know, rolling crush on the 1320 continues, I am getting more questions from guys owning or that own 1320s as far as, you know, what can they do to make their car a little bit faster? What are they, what are the options, things like that? And again, that's why I've got this intake manifold that I ported sitting right here. So we can talk about that. Um, but it's cool because I'm starting to see some more old school guys making the transition over to the new school cars. And a lot of it is guys that are in there. And I, this is super cool. It's a lot of guys that are in their fifties and sixties that are buying these 1320s with most of them having just enough of experience with these cars, both back in the day and modern variants of them to know that, you know, a ton of power is only as good as the tires that are bolted to the back of the thing. And of course the surface that you're on. And so these guys are just trying to get a little bit more out of the car and they understand that, there's only a limited amount of improvement that you can get over something that is already vastly superior from what you're used to dealing with. So cool on that. But anyway, getting into it, the stuff that works, and I want to talk about some things that I've tested recently and just kind of give you my two cents on this. So you got a 392 car talking about a Challenger. First thing you need to do, Hellcat airbox with a Hellcat filter. I have tested, so we're going to talk about cold air intakes first. I guess I should have prefaced that. Um, I have tested so many different cold air, and I use an air, term, air, air quotes here, cold air intakes on these cars that it's, I've, I've forgotten probably half of the ones that I've tested. I've dyno tested them. I've track tested them. I've street tested them. I've done all these tests with these, with these intakes. And the one thing that I have come away with over and over and over again is that the stock Hellcat air box with the snorkel along with the Hellcat air filter seems to work the best in most, if not all, of the applications that I've seen so far. If nothing else, it's the least expensive and yields identical results to much more expensive variants. So what do I mean by all that? Well, um, I, with the Hellcat and with Chalandra, have basically discovered that, and, and go back and take a look at that. There was a short live video that I did where I pulled in real time, I had the stock filter in the car, I made had some data data logs, and then I pull over and I start the live video at that point. I pull the filter out, make some hits, stop, and in real time, reinstall the filter, make some more hits, data logging the entire time, and the runs with the stock filter actually showed better data, higher KPA, which translates into higher boost, um, and a greater metered, or I should say measured, air charge with the stock filter. The green filter that I tested was basically the same as no air filter in the box at all. Um, and the K and N would fall somewhere in between just based on what I know as far as how that thing is going to flow. Probably I take it back. K and N probably would have come in last place just because it doesn't flow near as much as the green. But then again, the stock filter doesn't probably flow as much, but yet it still flows 1100 CFM. See where I'm going with this? Get the stock filter, throw it in the box. Yeah, if you've got a Challenger, it's real easy. You just put the snorkel in, Hellcat lower, and you go uh, on your way. Now, if you've got one of the older chargers, that's where you're going to run into a bit of a problem because you got to remove the front fascia to get the snorkel to work. So uh, if you got a charger, bummer. But if you've got a Challenger, there's really nothing better. And so, for example, on the on Chalandra, I, char I tried the Legmaker True Cold Air Kit. I tried the Mopar Cold Air Kit. 
uh, tried one of the uh, just the regular open element cold air kits. Um, tried a couple of drop in filters with that thing. By the way, the dry filters are junk. Don't even waste your time with them. Um, and then with the Hellcat, the Hellcat's kind of funny. And I only use the Hellcat. I know I'm trying to stay on NA stuff here, but I use the Hellcat as kind of a taking a you know, taking that part to an extreme duty cycle, if you will. Uh, the Hellcat was pretty funny because we have tried K&N drop-ins. We've tried JLT cold airs. We've tried open element uh, setups. We've tried everything at the drag strip. And I got to tell you, none of them have really worked. And so I've even reached out to a couple of fellow YouTubers and just asked, hey, when you guys tried this, what did you get? Haven't had a response yet. Imagine that. But anyway, um, I guess the point here is that I've discovered that with these cars, it just doesn't make any sense to try to spend a bunch of money. Just go with that Hellcat lower. And again, and with the Hellcat filter, I can only speak from my own personal experience with car after 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 car on the dyno um, and at the drag strip and street validating. So there's my take right there. Nothing surprising, I'm sure. But for some of the new guys, I understand that it can be a little bit mind numbing where you have been bombarded with marketing that tells you that this product, this cold air kit is going to pick up X number of horsepower. It doesn't. It doesn't pick up on the track and it doesn't pick up on the street so far as I can tell. But what I will tell you that they can do good is in extremely high horsepower applications. I can tell you that in some respects, there could be an argument for a large open element just Big pipe, big filter could potentially and probably would potentially do better than stock. But that means that you have to exceed the stock filter, fil basically flow, um, and you'd be giving up the filtration of the stock filter if you're just driving the car around. And for the most part, to get to that number on a Mustang dyno, so far as what I have seen, what I have experienced is somewhere around, and this is on a Mustang dyno, which is an eddy current dyno, no less. Uh, you've got to be up around 850 plus horsepower to the rear wheels for that system to significantly impact power production. And you got to keep in mind, I mean, we've tried everything with, a, you know, every application you can dream up still doesn't work as well as the stock filter and airbox. So, if it's good enough for those applications, it's probably good enough for yours. <clears throat> and I get it, there's different pulse waves, and supercharged is not naturally aspirated, and there's different dynamics that go on and on and on. Yeah, I know, I know. But, again, when we're talking about taxing airflow, just from a flow standpoint, I mean, my car was making more power with the stock airbox with the stock filter than without. So... I'm going to go ahead and stop with the cold airs there. Go ahead and check in with you guys real quick. Uh, Jess Campos is checking in. David Barlow is checking in from Canada. What's going on, man? Uh, Shake saying checking in from Ohio. Very nice. Love Ohio. High Street, baby. Uh, ask me how I know. Uh, Rift is checking in. Uh, hey, B, what's up? Uh, Rift is checking in. E85 is the best first mod for a blower turbo car. We're going to get to that here in just a little bit. Uh, Rock saying, sup, fellas. Ruth saying, sup. Uh, scavengers checking in. Let's see. Oh, Jazz is saying, I've got a 2019 Red Eye Supercharger that has a broken snout coupler bolt. Supercharger is in perfect shape, about 6,000 miles on the supercharger. What do you think it's worth? Um, I might probably trade somebody for a Hellcat supercharger. I, you know, I the, the red eye superchargers. I, I, I don't, I don't really know that I can put a value on that. Um, you know, if, if it's broken, fifteen hundred bucks just to offload it, maybe two grand to offload it. Good blower, a little bit too much heat, but it's still a good upgrade for guys that just want a slight bump in power um, and just a plug and play for their Hellcat. 
Sam's needing to find someone to tune his truck. Riff saying JLT is good for wine, good for the wine. So the thing about it is that, yeah. So, okay. So I know I said I was done with it, but here's the thing for, for the guys that are supercharged. And again, I was, you know, mainly focusing on the NA guys, but for the guys that are supercharged, the only time I recommend a cold air kit is for you to enjoy your car more. Don't think of it as power. It, it just don't think of it as theater. Think of it as part of the whole driving experience. And uh, when you think of it in those terms, it, they work out great. You get to hear the supercharger more. It's, you know, if that's what you want, you can definitely do it. But don't do it expecting any horsepower or improvements in ET. You know, now that I mentioned that, so the only time, and, and this is this is still a little bit up for debate between the three of us, because all three of us, me, Chris, and Robert, we're, we've all been playing around with different combinations with intakes and things like that. Just basically, we're all data logging and see what we can get out of them. The only thing I saw different with the JLT was that when the DA was really, really bad, like the temperature was real hot the whole bit, that intake... And this is a little bit up for debate, but that intake may have had a, just the tiniest of an advantage, half a tenth, in really crappy DA for whatever reason. And we still haven't been able to quite figure that out, but the car would consistently mile an hour well, the, and the ET was about maybe half a tenth quicker. But again, that is, it's unsubstantiated. We're, we're both still kind of, we're all still kind of scratching our heads with that, but um, anyway, mine didn't ever, I didn't test it on mine because I didn't see any bump in his, his, uh, you know, there wasn't any power on his end. Sovereign's taking it in saying, what I be? Um, <laughs> Scavenger 1320 saying, I lied, I did one weight reduction mod. Uh, I got the Mopar TA kit, makes the hood scoop functional, and that's the main reason I got it, not because I expected a power increase. It helps to get some cold air down in there. I will tell you that that weird jog that it does kind of throws me off a little bit. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I was actually trying to figure out a way to make one of those functional. Just in terms of redirecting air uh, for the Hellcat. But I haven't had a chance to play with it too much. Let's see. Oh, Sovereign Knight's checking in. Uh, Sam's thinking about a Hell Crate for a Dodge. Work well. Um, <laughs> Ripped is saying, I was told that if I take my cats off, now that I'm on E, I could gain 30 wheel horsepower. Is this true? Well, you'll pick up power just based on your particular pulley ratio. I mean, you're running a little bit more aggressive pulleys, and you've got you know, 30% more exhaust mass, at least in terms of, you know, being on the fuel side to contend with. Um, I, even at that power level, man, I don't look at 30 horsepower as, uh, as a number. And the reason why I say that is Robert's car is a perfect example of this. A 285 upper car uh, in really good air will run consistent 970s on, you know, pump gas with a little boosting added to it. And that car still has the factory catalytic converters. So, you know, 970s at just shy of 140 miles an hour. Actually, that car has gone 141. Um, and again, stock catalytic converters. I, I don't think that you're necessarily going to, it's not going to be the difference between, you know, where you're at and, you know, dropping any real number of ET off the car. Just saying. And I'll tell you something else. At that power level, we really haven't seen a lot gain from removing the cats. Unless the car is going into cat over temp. If the car is going into cat over temp, and again, this is going to be something you need to log. But if you see the car going into cat over temp, and it's a pretty significant number, it goes from equivalent ratio of like, you know, if you're tuned set up to like uh, an AFR of 12.0, like a Lambda of, uh, you know, 82.82, 81, somewhere in that range, and it really starts throwing fuel at it, then yeah, you might might consider uh, pulling the cats off of it. 
In that case, it will pick up quite a bit of power. Catalyst 99 saying live long and prosper. I like it. Bruce is saying, um, have heard about the new synthetic fuel uh, for gas motors that Porsche has engineered and claims it would make them as clean as electric motors. I've heard about it. <clears throat> Not really sure what all has gone into that, but, um, you know, synthetic fuels are nothing new. They're just costly. And, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, synthetic fuels have been uh, something the Germans got really good at at the tail end of World War II. So there's certainly that to consider. Uh, but as far as, you know, just in terms of a history behind it, but um, don't know anything specifically about it. I don't have any type of data sheets on that on that fuel, but I'm looking forward to what they're saying. Rip's saying, hit me up about that red eye blower. Tuxedo saying, A.B. Mason, how's life going? Going good, Tux. Chris checking in from K uh, Kansas City. Sam saying, uh, I say the same to people that have turbos. A non-baffled true cold air is cold air intake is worth it. Tuxedo saying, I'm on right now on my tablet drawing characters. I wish I could draw, man. I can't draw anything. I can barely draw a stick figure. Um, they're actually cats because I love cats, and that's my fa one of my favorite animals. Nice. I had a cat. I love that cat. My dad had a really cool shop cat. Um, loved hanging out in the garage when we were working on cars. Alberta's checking in saying, hey, B, thanks for the advice on the 6.4. I ended up trading my 10 6.1 Challenger for that 6.4 Scat Pack. It's awesome car, but just need to get rid of the K&N and k and &N cold air intake. Yeah, you do. Just sell it, man. Somebody's going to buy it. Um, grab you the Hellcat setup and you'll be in really good shape. Speaking of intakes and things that suck in air, um, the, the next, uh, let's talk about the next mod. Um, well, no, I'm going to hold off on the intake manifold thing and, and throttle body. Let's talk about exhaust systems and things like that. What exhaust systems work? What headers would I recommend? Things like that. Um, because the list is teeny tiny, and that's the main thing that you got to remember with these cars is that the list is very small. The recipe is very specific. Going outside of the list, going outside of the recipe is a surefire way to get a mismatch combination that simply won't work, uh, primarily because you've got a set of cylinder heads on these cars that is trying to flow 320, 340 CFM uh, through an intake manifold, as you will see here, with some long runners. And those long runners are there to try to build velocity at partial throttle and at um, lower lower RPM. Yes, it's an active intake manifold, but it's primarily uh, in a long runner configuration unless you are really in the throttle. Um, but anyway, long tube headers, long have been the first go-to for guys to build horsepower. I mean, it's it's the first thing that you would put on any old hot rod, any old, you know, Chevelle, Mustang, Dart, whatever you were playing with, you'd always have the long tube headers on there first, and for good reason. Um, but nowadays, things are a little bit different. And with modern cam profiles, especially with the Hemi being what they are, their lobe separation angle is extremely wide. <clears throat> Both the Hellcat and the 392 camshafts are actually extremely similar in their profile with the only real difference being that the Hellcat camshaft has more duration on the exhaust side. So in understanding that, it, when you know that you have a very wide lobe separation angle, what that means is that there's not that much of an opportunity for scavenging, which is really what the long tube headers are there to help. And you think of it in terms of time. In other words, how much time is there for scavenging is that piston is coming down off of the power stroke and it fires or it opens up the exhaust valve, fires out the exhaust uh, port, exhaust valve as the, sorry, I've been messing, looking at two strokes and rotaries also today. Um, as that piston is coming down, as the exhaust gas is blowing out of that exhaust valve, it is going to help bring in the charge on the intake side. The more time there is for overlap, the more opportunity that there is for scavenging. 
Well, in terms of a supercharger, you've got a supercharger that's handling all that scavenging for you, uh, usually, and that wide low separation angle does two things. One, it gives you really good boost response down low, as well as a nice idle. Um, but it allows the, the, since you're opening up the exhaust valve early with that wide low separation angle, you're able to evacuate that cylinder a little bit more efficiently. So when we come to the point of the NA cars, that wide low separation angle gives you a good idle quality because it's keeping those intake runners active, so to speak. Um, but what it does is it reduces the opportunity for scavenging. So when you put long tube headers on a car with a very wide lobe separation angle and a very long runner intake, basically what you're doing is you are improving partial throttle, tip in throttle response, low RPM, say up to 4,000 RPM at the most. Um, you're improving wide open throttle torque for about well, from 2,500 to about 37, 3,800, maybe past peak torque at about 42 to 4,300, but typically not much further than that. But what you're also doing, you have to remember, is you're lengthening the amount of time before the scavenging effect would take place. And when you have that long tube, you are in effect uh, hurting top end horsepower. I know it's counterintuitive, but the long tube headers, even at one and seven eighths inch diameter, can still hurt top end performance a little bit. Now, the 392, even with that cam, doesn't suffer too much. It will, at worst, be just about what the stock headers would give you. But with the benefit of having better drivability, better tip in throttle response, better torque down low, plus it sounds really good but don't expect to get any big power numbers out of those things. Now, this is about the time that you start talking about mods, and I should have really started this segment by saying this. This is where a tune is going to be practically mandatory. You've got to be able to change your exhaust. Hold on. So, as you guys know, where the, the office is, is very near uh, Velocicito. And uh, so every once in a while, you'll hear guys heading out to uh, go across the border, so to speak. So um, they're just, you know, right here in the middle of all of that. Pretty nice cars are running around here today, at least this afternoon. Anyway, getting back to it. Um, exhaust pulse timing is going to be very important in terms of the computer having a good understanding as far as from when the cylinder fires to where it sees that pulse at the first O2, that's your cylinder pulse timing. And so you have to change that for long tube headers for it to work properly. But all that being said, um, headers, again, no matter what you're told in terms of advertising for total horsepower, you're not going to get that with just the headers alone. Uh, it's the headers with the tune that are going to get you those power numbers. At least, let me rephrase that that will get you anywhere potentially possibly even close to what those power numbers are that are being advertised by the manufacturer. But again, I would never suggest going by what the manufacturer is claiming because that is in a overwhelmingly specific set of circumstances. I would say that, by the way, which header is what I recommend. And I, guys, y'all know I'm not sponsored over here by any, you know, engine parts manufacturer. Um, I would certainly go with uh, go with Cooks uh, straight away. Best fit, um, best performance, the whole bit. Yeah, I get it. They're pricey. But man, listen, in this game, you get what you pay for sometimes. And with Cooks, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I cannot stress this enough. The part has to be able to have a fit and finish. Uh, when you go to install this or when whoever goes to install these things, you don't want to be fighting it. You don't want to be wrestling it. That's the main thing. So these things are already enough of a pain in the ass to install. Um, you don't want to be running into any other issues. So there's your benefits to those, uh, those headers. And again, uh, for the guys that are looking for any cat back advice, um, look, 
it's really hard to beat the factory system, whether it's the Hellcat or the uh, or the Scat Pack systems. They're just really difficult to to beat. So, you know, I I know some will say and claim you know specific gains. Uh, that's those are some one-off results. I really haven't seen uh, catbacks or anything like that pick up any power. Um, I will say that on a five-seven car, this is where you can definitely pick up some power, though, because they use those terrible log uh, manifolds that don't offer any level of scavenging at any level, really, to speak of. Um, so a switch to a set of six-four manifolds and a six-four catback. You can find those on forums or on, you know, Facebook Marketplace or wherever. You can find those parts, in some cases, fairly readily available uh, for guys that have sold or that, that have installed long tubes and have other kits. You can get them from those guys, too. So I um, always recommend cleaning up the welds inside of those uh, factory manifolds. In some cases, you won't pick up anything. In other cases, I've actually ported manifolds and picked up power. So, you know, it's you've got to take a look at them and make that call for yourself. I will tell you it's, it's, it's kind of funny, but I have picked up power there. So, uh, but a five, seven, I doubt would actually tax even some of the more crusty looking welded manifold. So, um, uh, let's see. Bose is saying first mod, not in my opinion for drag stick we, uh, is wheels and drag radials. So, yeah, I would agree with that. I think right now we're really just talking about something that you can get a result on on the dyno. Um, but since we broached the subject, guys, look, you know, these modern cars with the modern transmissions, the amount of power that they're making, these factory tires are woefully inadequate. Um, a move to a drag radial, I would say, is all but mandatory with these cars. If you plan on having any semblance of traction, uh, just playing around with the thing in general. Now, that being said, you know, I get that a lot of guys get a little bit squeamish when they're talking about drag radials in the wet. Um, as well, you should be because they're really not designed to be a daily type of a tire. But for the guys that do drive their cars quite a bit in fair weather conditions, they are ideal for just running around in general, playing around with your car. Um, now, if you're going to ask me which one is the best, I'm going to have to say for right now, Mickey Thompson ET Street SS is going to be the best. They've got a great size variety. The NT05 from Nitto just doesn't really have the size variety. If it had a 305, 35, 20, I'd probably be on board. Um, for a set of those, I really do like Nitto's quite a bit, but from a performance point of view, from a fitment point of view, the Mickey Thompsons are really good. The old Nitto 555Rs, not to be confused with a 555R2, uh, but the original Tri-5s were really good. Looked good, they you know had a good fit and everything. No real clearance issues. If you plan on getting a set of uh, 555 R2, just know coming into that conversation that they do run big. They, uh, for a set of 305 uh, 35s, they actually fit like a set of 315s, so much so that I had to make adjustments to my inner fender well to get them to have the clearance that I wanted out of them. Whereas my Nittos, I didn't have any issue like that at all. So just know that coming into it, they will sit a little bit fat on a set of 10 and a half inch wheels. Now, if you've got an 11 inch wide wheel, probably a great tire for you. And you never really even, you put them on the wheels and not even know what I'm ever talking about. You'd never notice what I've seen with those tires. So um, for the guys with the challengers that are gonna be running the replica 10 and a half, because uh, an 11 just is out of the question, that, uh, that Mickey Thompson is gonna fit well because it's basically straight up and down in line with the wheel, whereas the Nitto bulges out a little bit. So hopefully that answers that question. In terms of tires go, um, actually, that there wasn't a question about it, but you know what I'm saying. Um, Riff's asking, will a stock intake off of a Hellcat fit on a 6.4? If you're talking about the intake airbox, yo, yeah, for sure. That's the one that you buy. 
If you're, yeah, I think that's what you're asking. Yes, it will. Uh, oh, Tuxedo say, if you want to learn how to practice drawing, then check out Mark Kistler. He's an artist YouTuber. Very cool. If I, I just don't have the patience, man. I wish I had the patience to do it, but I, I will I will admire the, the efforts and the results from those that are more talented than I am, of which there are many. <laughs> Speaking saying, hey, B, with SRT being dissolved, do you think the super stock red eye was the last version of the supercharged semi that we'll see or anything else coming out before the EVs? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Don't, don't get it mixed up, man. There's no... SRT going away, you can almost think of it as now Stellantis racing development or racing technology, I should say. Um, no, you're still going to see those products being sent out into the world. I, I, mainly what I what my understanding is, is that the SRT team is being dispersed throughout Stellantis to try to build up Stellantis and to build up their image, primarily with Peugeot, which is kind of strange in a way because of Peugeot's unbelievably rich uh, racing heritage. I mean, that is a company that has, I mean, as a pedigree that is second to very few, I would say, in the industry. So, but no, I, the, the red, the, none of the red eyes, none of the, the super stocks, uh, are going away. The Hellcat certainly isn't going away. That platform will probably see that company straight till the end at this stage. Um, but yeah, no, I, and, and until the, the full on EV platforms start to take shape, um, I would not look for those or the six, four for that matter to go away anytime real soon. And I'll actually take that a step farther. So we are sitting in, uh, 2021 right now, and uh, although the first part of 2021, with absolutely no indication from Dodge that they will be not re-upping the LX platforms in 2023. The LX platform is, the licensing agreement is slated, if I'm not mistaken, to end uh, after the 2023 model year. So you have 21, 22, 23 and then the 2024 would presumably be either a new platform or a revised version of the LX or would be, in essence, a uh, basically a re-up for the agreement with Mercedes-Benz uh, for that LX platform. So I, I just it, it's kind of funny to me at this stage of the game. I can't even speculate anymore because we've been told and at least led to believe so many different scenarios to play out the Ghibli platform, the Julia platform, the revision of the LX, the no revision LX. Um, at this stage, I would just say, <clears throat> you know, I, I would keep my money on, on, on the number right now and just let it ride. <laughs> Sovereign saying it's called that because people travel at high velocity in Velocicito. See, <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, Velocicito Tejas. Um, Pat saying, uh, SRT going away, eh, kind of in a way, um, more like being absorbed through uh, Stellantis. Tuxedo saying, Tomorrow's his mom's birthday. Well, happy birthday to your mom, my friend. Saying, I'll be giving her this drawing and she'll 100% love it. I like it, I bet she will. You put a lot of work into it, man. Keep it up. Uh, Mark saying, uh, just the kind of stream I want to see from Professor B. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Roxy's still stocking. I'm still working on my build list before I get her uh, to be one rowdy five seven. So let's talk about kind of the elephant in the room. No pun intended, I guess, but no, no way to do it. Anyway, we're showing, showing the intake that I just got the reporting. And this is the, the intake portion of this is something that I want to give you guys as a little bit of a caveat. If, if you're a little bit squeamish about taking your car apart, this mod may not be for you, but I can tell you that I have been able to pick up power by porting intake manifolds. Uh, and, and I can show you what this thing looks like on the inside, but if you've never actually seen one, it, it won't do you a whole lot of good. But just suffice it to say that 
when I open up one of these things, I'm not messing around. So um, anyway, that's the throat. Looks like a freaking catfish down there. Um, and then the runners, let me know if we can see anything on these runners. Hopefully that's showing, oh God, right in the face. Um, here we go. Anyway, I'll kind of give you an idea how opened up those things are now. Um, and how cleaned up they are. That's the other thing. I smooth all the transitions, open everything up. Basically what I do when I port a manifold, it's not porting. And I don't really like that phrase. I am opening things up. I'm smoothing transitions. And, and, and what I mean by smoothing transitions is these intake manifolds, when you look at them, they're actually in several pieces. You can see right here where they come together. They come together back down here as well. And then this is all, the runner side of it is all one piece. And there's only so far up into that thing that you can realistically go. But the good thing is you can get to um, all of the seams. And keep in mind, when I say seams, I mean that. You've got, think of this thing as a ham sandwich, like three, three pieces. As they're being pressed and, and sonic welded together, each piece can kind of move around a little bit during that process. I've had some of them move this way. I've had some of them move this way. I've had some of them get cockeyed with a little bit of yaw to them. This one's a little bit different, and I'm actually really stoked with this manifold. It just sucks. I got to get the the owner of this manifold has got to get the right throttle body. He needs to get a hold of Doctor Differential and get one of his 85 millimeter freaking pieces of jewelry that he's got. Um, cause this thing's going to kick ass. I mean, th this thing actually worked out pretty well, but this one was kind of funny. It was actually kicked up in the back anyway. And, and I can tell all that by the way, just the, the separation of the seams within the runners and things like that. It's just, it's always interesting. Well, this one, some of these intakes have thicker castings than others too. And I was able to I just get after it with this manifold. I mean, I, I was giving this thing hell and it just kept taking it. So um, good, good, solid casting. Some of them are thinner. Some of them are really thick. Dr. Differential gave me one that I thought was, I was never going to get cut. That thing was super thick. Um, but this is one of the earlier, this is a 20, came off a 2015 car. The, the, the dating on the manifold has it at, I think October of 2014, if I remember what the clocks say on this thing. Anyway, was able to pull a lot of material out of it. Long story short, um, for the six fours, it's going to depend on what shape that manifold is in. Uh, some of the more jacked up intakes, you can actually pick up power. Uh, some of the real clean ones, you'll pick up some, but you're basically just accommodating the larger throttle body that you're putting on the car. Um now, to that point, which throttle body do I recommend? I, no bigger than an 85 millimeter, primarily because the throat area that I just showed you guys earlier, <clears throat> the way that it sets and the way that it drops down, there's no, it, it actually pinches. It kind of goes in like that. See right there where it drops down right after the that boss right here and right up underneath here, it actually pinches down. And that's where a lot of guys, when they're trying to port their own intakes, <clears throat> number one, they're using the wrong stuff to port them. And number two, they get way too aggressive with them and they'll cook holes in the, uh, in the polymer right there. That's where some of the softer, I'm sorry, some of the thinner portions of the casting can be found. So you just have to be a little bit careful with that. But uh, I've been doing, I've done a ton of manifolds. So, um, and everybody that's got them, the data looks fantastic on them. So uh, there's that. Pair them up with a cam with a big throttle body. They do real well. I mean, it's pretty cool to see. I mean, the data itself to say that you could maybe get a little bit more performance out of uh, out of a little bit more port volume, I would say would be about the most I would hope for uh, for, a you know, a, if they were to revise these intakes, but 
with with a camshaft, you reduce the activity of those intake runners. And I mean, Quick Brick's car at one point is flat uh, atmospheric pressure down low, and it stays basically within about half an inch of mercury all the way through the top of the pool. So not too shabby for a stock manifold. You'd always want to have a little bit uh, less of a restriction there. But to be honest with you, that's really good by you know, at least old carburetor standards. And if nothing else, it still is retaining a lot of velocity running through the runners. So, um, and there's really nothing else you can do to get any more power out of the, the stock 6.4 intake manifold. I know a lot of guys have talked about using the Hellcat throttle body and all of that. I, I mean, the, there isn't a reason to. Again, with the way that these things neck down, you're basically maybe optimizing what you would hope to get out of an 80, a true through bore 84 millimeter or 85 millimeter throttle body. But uh, like I say, Dr. Differential's, pieces are like they're like a piece of jewelry so um that's the one that i would recommend first uh i know that fast man i've always recommended fast man throttle bodies so uh, i'm never going to not recommend his work but the um those ones from doc differential those billet pieces are just so nice so but that's as big as i can open this thing up to a couple of guys have asked about you know how big can you open them up to it's like i uh, can't really answer that question because depends on the shape of the manifold it depends on how much core shift there is which is what i was telling you you know how much side to side front to back yaw whatever how screwed up the manifold is in general how thick the casting is but i really can't get any more than about 84 to 85 millimeter reliably for about the first inch and a half two inches of that throat from there i've got to blend some things around i'm actually reshaping the inside of this thing so any larger throttle body just really won't do a whole lot of good. But for the guys that really want to get just more out of the car in general, a little bit better drivability, a little bit better torque production, a little bit better up top, manifold's the way to go. Now, how much horsepower will you get out of it? Again, it depends on how jacked up your intake manifold is. And by the way, before I get too far away from the topic, I really don't consider it porting per se, it's more blueprinting. It's getting this piece to flow and act and do the things that the engineers had originally wanted that piece to, or getting it to perform the way that the engineers wanted it to perform. Um, a lot of times what ends up happening is, is that, you know, these engines are put together, they're, you know, on a, you know, in the computer, they, they are, they're perfect, right? But when manufacturing processes come into play, you end up with, well, like I say, you end up with kind of funky stuff when, you know, you get all these different pieces that are lining up. And in this case, the back part, which is back here, is actually kicked up just slightly, which I thought was pretty funny. I've never seen one like that. Um, I've seen a lot of them, again, all core shifted, but they've all core shifted in kind of a, a two-dimensional plane. Um They've never actually kind of <laughs> done what this one did, but it cleaned up so nice. And because I was able to get that much material out of it with these thicker castings that this one happened to have, this thing's going to flow. I mean, it's as far as a, uh, a you know a stock manifold is is concerned, it's going to do pretty good. So I'm looking forward to the results with that. But um, but again, as far as power goes, I think the most we've seen is about 13 horsepower to the rear wheels. That's not to say that your car is going to get 13 horsepower with it. Hell, who knows? It may get more. It may get less. But um, when they're done right, it's a supporting modification. And again, think of it like blueprinting your intake manifold. It's just getting the most out of the stock parts safely, you know, not going too crazy. Um, I have gone kind of nuts <laughs> with intake manifolds. Uh, quick brick has got one that is, that baby is as opened up as you can get it. <laughs> um, but that's, that's actually my old intake manifold and it's, it's been backfilled with epoxy and all this other stuff. So, 
Um, but even still, I mean, the data isn't really much different between that and what this one would perform at because you're, you can't really get so far up into that runner. But again, you're still able to blend the seams. And so that's important. If you ever want to get into doing these things, it's not that difficult to do. It's just you learn by doing with these things. You, you, there, there's no real way to practice. You just have to, you know, get you a handful of old LS2 intakes, some old ass uh, in any of the polymer intakes and just learn the pressure, learn the technique. And it's not that tough to do. Um, but I, like I say, I just, it's my, uh, you'll see me when I you know, start posting. It's about this time of year is when I'll start porting and it's well, time to go sculpt some horsepower. So anyway, a good, a good modification. Think of it like a supporting mod. But with the Hemis, here's the funny thing. Every little modification that you do to them seems to pick up power, but it picks up more in performance than it really does in power. What I've noticed, <clears throat> especially if you're looking at dyno numbers, because these things, man, they are growers, not showers, big time. The funny thing is that like I, I keep bringing up Quick Bricks Charger primarily because it's the one I'm most impressed by. It's also the heaviest iteration of the 392 platform in terms of cars go. I mean, that thing's checking in at like 4,600 pounds. Um, and, you know, it's weird. That car went from running like 12 O's to 1160s or something like that. But the difference in horsepower really wasn't all that much. You know, you're looking at maybe 15 or 20 horsepower, but, you know, here it is. It picks up half a second. What gives? That didn't even make sense, right? It's just weird, though. Every little gain that you get seems to go even that much farther. So anyway, kind of something to think about. If you're thinking about going with a ported manifold, I will say that it's best to, if you have a 6.4 car, um, send your intake manifold out. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. If you're going to send it out to get ported, send your manifold out. See that sensor looking thing with the, it's a finger of my rubber glove on the bottom so I didn't get anything into the, the connector. That is your uh, short runner valve actuator. And if you've got a 15 or a 16, I don't think we ran into these problems with the 17s. Whenever you go to start your car, or your truck for that matter, because the trucks have these too, cars seem to be real, can be very, I don't know, sensitive, I guess is a good word to say when it comes to this. The car will run the valve actuator through its range of motion, number one, to check to make sure it's working, and number two, to find out where it's at in life. Because the car, the, the way that it's programmed is that it does a self-check because, I mean, the, the motor could have burned out. You put a new motor in it. It does a self-check, finds its range, and then it, self, it basically it self-calibrates. Uh, yeah. Some intake manifolds, the butterfly, and you really cannot see. If you've ever wondered what the butterfly looks like in one of these manifolds, let me see if I can. You should be able to see it. The butterfly itself is this little green thing, and I can't actuate it because the um, the actuator is on there. See that little green thing right there? That is actually the butterfly for the number one cylinder right here because it's going to wrap around and come over here. Anyway, um, some of the manifolds, butterflies open more than others. Some will open up just a tiny amount, like just an itty bitty amount. Others will open up, not like this or anything, but just more, okay? Um, it's just a linkage thing inside of there. And what's weird is there's apparently a range. And this isn't anything that you can go into a tune and just change. But there's a range that some computer operating systems are cool with and others aren't. We ran into this problem the, a problem that, to be honest with you, I, th I thought was never going to go away with, with Quick Bricks car. But um, anyway, I always suggest sending your manifold out, have them port it, and, and send it back to you. That way you not only have your manifold, you've got your actuator on there, the whole bit. Um, 
only because you want to just keep working with what you have. And again, with the with the actuator on there, it's holding everything nice and shut. Everything's under tension. You're in good shape. So um, kind of a you know, pro tip for you guys. I just don't want anybody to get one of these things and strip everything off of it, send it off. They do whatever they do, cut it and send it back to you and run into problems. Um, so I've always been a big proponent since then of just, you know, if it came off the car, you know, report the one that's going back onto the car. So there's your, there's your intake, uh, porting in, in a nutshell. Um, the five, seven cars do wake up with that. The five sevens, by the way, are usually the worst shape. The five, seven cars. I mean, seriously, they make so many of them, right? I mean, it's just, you can imagine this machine just, just making intake manifolds, but, um, they, uh, they're usually the ones with the most, uh, slag on the inside of the runners, uh, core shift really isn't a problem with the car manifolds because it's just a two piece. It's just like that. So there's typically not a whole lot of movement on those, but there is on these, these three piece and multi piece, uh, manifolds that with the, uh, active runners. But, um, you know, just again, something to consider with, with, if you're thinking about going this route, um, you're going to be up against, you know, some really good engineering already, but to clean them up and to blueprint, I, again, I don't like using the word port, but I'll, I'll, I have to, cause that's like what people call it. But when you clean these things up and you blueprint them, they will pick up power. In fact, I've, the, the biggest gains that I get, or at least from people that have told me, uh, like, man, I really appreciate the work you did and all this other stuff. A lot of them have been five sevens. So let's see. Oh, Pat saying the stock exhaust on my SRT crimped down to as much as two and a quarter inch. Use the same mufflers as the RT. Yeah, it was supposed to be 275. Now for most people, uh, it doesn't make sense to change it out. No, not really. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't really worry so much about that. Uh, exhaust is kind of a funny thing. Um, exhaust restrictions and, and, and what most folks think of in terms of flow, um, you'd be surprised how much that exhaust will actually flow. But yeah, I would prefer for it to be uniform, if nothing else. Really saying the legendary Mr. Norm passed away today. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I never kept up with that. Let's see. Uh, Turtle is saying, I got a 6.4, and if I don't start it for a couple of days, it makes a weird, loud, broken lifter sound for like a couple of seconds and then goes away. But if I start it up every day, it doesn't. Um, check your oil level, for one. Um, that can absolutely be that. What you're hearing is it's uh, probably not a lifter. It might be a lifter. It just bled down. But uh, check your oil level. They will do that if they're low on oil. Uh, HG37 saying the stock exhaust manifolds and the 6.4 are actually pretty efficient while the stock 5.7 manifolds are junk. Very true. Is it worth installing 6.4 manifolds on the 5.7? Yeah, you, I would say go with the full exhaust system, though, so it's a match set. But, yeah, I would say definitely do that. Pat saying no. NT Tri-5 RS in 305-4518 on Demon Wheels rocks for the street. Uh, maybe, but I will tell you that I have the, uh, the tri five R's and I've done actually four videos on those tires, uh, 305, 45, 20 on those wheels. And it's those wheels that I'm comparing them to, because that's my daily setup for a lot of folks. If you're in a, and you're running those tires, uh, they will hook just fine at the drag strip. They work really well on the street too. Um, especially on a set of, uh, you know, bravados and the 18 inch size is probably the more popular, uh, to run around on the street. I know a lot of guys down here run bravados for their street setup. So, uh, in that respect, probably not too bad, but when you get into the twenties, uh, I've got the demon reps on mine and, um, they, they do run wide. And that was in fact, one of the biggest complaints and, and take it another step farther um, when I was over at Pike's Performance, uh, one of the shaker cars had the exact 
uh, demon reps that I've got with the Mickey Thompson ET Street SSs. And it was a marketable difference between the two tires, the way that they fit on those wheels. In fact, so much so that, I mean, it, it was, <laughs> it was kind of interesting when I saw it, I was just thinking right then and there, these, these tri fives are going for sale. So, um, but the problem with the tri five is that they are the R2 is that they are incredibly good in wet weather, especially when they're new. So, I don't know. And that's my daily setup. And I like driving that car a lot. So, you know, we take it on road trips and do all that kind of fun stuff with them on the car. And it's good to know that I've got a certain level of uh, uh, th there's a certain level of safety kind of built into that thing. So uh, let's see. Uh, M Hot Rod saying, always a great show. What are your thoughts on the 274 cam with ported heads on a Pro Charge 5.7 Hemi? So the 274, believe it or not, is actually a good blower cam. Um, it's a little bit long in the tooth in terms of the actual lobe shape. Uh, it's a, got a little bit more of an old school lobe shape uh, from my understanding of the cam. But uh, it's 116 degree lobe separation angle, uh, 224, 232, 234, something like that. I can't remember the exact specs on it, but when paired up with a supercharger, it does really well. So uh, I would not recommend it for NA, but yeah, boost, you'll be in pretty good shape with that cam. The funny thing is that we had a, a customer that had the 274 in a 5.7 and it was one of the in a car and it was one of the weirdest things because that car you could mat the throttle with uh with drag radials and it would not even chirp the tires it was pretty pretty interesting car to drive but it would just keep revving it was just <laughs> pretty funny um i did the finish up on the transmission tune on that car and you know when we're load testing them and, and catching data on the thing. It was just funny because it's like, good God, this thing is never going to stop revving. So, um, but it just also didn't make any power down low. But again, if you've got boost, not a bad setup. I will tell you though, that cam is dying for cylinder pressure. So if you can get away with it, try to maintain somewhere around six or seven pounds of boost with that setup. You'll be a little bit tougher than you might think. You may have to increase your, or decrease, I should say, your pulley ratio. Uh, in other words, throw a smaller pulley on that blower to keep that boost right around where you're going to need it. Because if you don't, it's going to be a turd. Take it from me on that one. Uh, CFL is checking in. I got the two, arm, two thumbs with the arms. I like it. Uh, Natalie's saying, I really need to send you my intake to port. Just need a tiny bit more power to be running uh, sixes with... Uh, uh, with the eight in the eighth with his 392, uh, only port for uh, for the industry. So pipes performance or doctor differential are the only two that I'm porting for right now. You would have to go through those guys. Uh, Sovereign saying probably will go to Alfa Romeo or Maserati platform. I can promise you it won't be Maserati because Maserati, you heard it here first, is going all electric. So. Uh, Alfa Romeo, yeah, I mean, you got the Julia and you got the Ghibli, but um, I, it, it change in platform, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. And that's the funny thing is that they had been talking about this change in platform for a while. In fact, the Julia was thrown out of the conversation because the Hemi wouldn't fit, um, or at least not without extensive modifications. It was going to create a bit of a headache. So then they were talking about the Ghibli platform, and apparently the Ghibli platform had its own list of uh, interesting pains in the asses. So, again, uh, I, that last that I heard, they were going to go back with a modified or a unmodified version of the LX and just carry it out for X number more years. Um, Bose is asking 160 or 180 thermostats are also a benefit for not a lot of money, doesn't gain power, but keeps it uh, on the table for longer. Yes and no. So you got to remember uh, 160, you will definitely throw a P128, uh, PO128 code um, for sure. It's going to throw the code. In fact, I did kind of, <laughs> I did the experiment with the 170, which is also basically it works the same as a 160. 
uh, thermostat with my car and it went for a long time before it finally threw the code. And I mean a long time. Um, but sure enough, PO 128 popped right up. It's like, you son of a bitch. Cause I had it, it, it was so weird that that 170 had been in it for probably God, several months. But anyway, uh, most cars, uh, a 180 may also throw the, the 128. It never threw a code in my Hellcat, but some of the NA cars will. Um, so you may need a tune if you're going to go with that thermostat. Now, here's what I will tell you. If you've got uh, a Hellcat, and so this is a good uh, segue into thermostats. So thank you very much. Um, so talking about thermostats, you've got some options out there. Stock, which nobody wants stock. Uh, the next step below stock is going to be like a 192 slash 195. Um, that is the thermostat that you can move to that isn't so far away from stock that you it would even notice a difference. Really driving down the highway, you'll see your temperatures down a little bit. You'll see your oil temps down just a little bit by about 10 degrees or so. And it won't throw any check engine lights. Uh, I've never heard of any car throwing a check engine light with a 192 or a 195. Below 192 or 195 comes the 180 thermostats. Now, here's where I want to caution you guys. Um, some cars, and when I say some, I'm going to say 30 to 40%, just because folks like to hear numbers and things like that. 30 to 40% of the cars may throw a code um, and it's really not year dependent, but it's kind of platform dependent. My Hellcat never threw a code with a 180, but my 392 did. Uh, Chalandra, my 2016 uh, Challenger did throw a code with a 180. So just something to consider. Now it took it a little bit. It took it about maybe a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks before it threw the code, but it did throw the code. Now, anything less than that obviously is going to throw a code at some point. You're just basically waiting for it to throw a code. But one thing I noticed, and for you guys with supercharger uh, applications, this is the weird thing about thermostats and do they pick up power, do they not pick up power? So the mistress will... When the water temps hit 194, all data identical, the car will actually show, no matter what, I, I, I still don't understand this, because I've been able to re replicate this, it'll actually pull a little bit on short-term knock retard. And keep in mind, that car is, it's very sedate the tune that's in that car. In fact, there's hardly any timing in it at all. It's only there to accommodate my transmission tune. But the same tune, all things considered, same conditions, everything else, same tank of gas on the same night at 192 degrees won't pull any short-term knock retarded. I'm looking at knock sensor voltage. I'm looking at uh, run time. I'm looking at everything, trying to figure out why in the world it would do it. And I still don't know. There's some modifier floating around in there that I just don't have access to, I guess. Um, but in that respect, the thermostat will help you hang on to power for longer. Um, you may not notice that as much in the NA cars, but again, for the supercharged guys, it is absolutely something to think about. And Really, that's where it's going to become more and more cru uh, critical and crucial when you have that level of cylinder pressure and that level of heat. You're going to want to keep everything around it as cool as possible. Obviously, the NA cars aren't going to be as affected, but they still are affected by that reduction in heat. So, um, but yeah, absolutely something to consider. Um now, is a 195, 192 worth it? Um, yeah, sort of. You know, a 190 you can get away with, so I would say you could go ahead and go with that. And if you don't want to get a tune because you're concerned about warranty, because once you get a tune, that warranty is out the window. 
um, then that would be the way that I would go and just take advantage of a little bit better uh, efficiency with that lower coolant temperature. Dr. Diff, what's up? Saying, check out my last comment for some Sierra action. We got her good. She fought hard, but we prevailed. Good. Make some room because Foxy's heading your way next. I got to call you because the freeze did a little something cute. Timing cover gasket. What do you say here? Said, uh, by the way, drove Sierra today for about 15 miles. She's doing good. I want to change the detent cable because it's hit or miss. Uh, I feel it's in the length. All, uh, He's going to give me a shout tomorrow. Just got home. She's running good. Very nice, man. Thank you very much. Like I said, get ready. I need to find a trailer with a winch. Um, that's awesome news, man. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, let's see. But thank you very much for the contribution. And... Um, and yeah, I need to get I need to get one of your throttle bodies on this manifold that I did last night, man. <clears throat> Y'all bear with me. I got to hang out with Doc Diff for a second. So this is one that I just got through doing. This one was actually, you know, we're always talking about core shift. This one was core shifted back up like that. If you can believe that. I've never had one do that. But anyway, you know how this is going to look. <laughs> look at that anyway um yeah they need to get one of your your throttle bodies on this thing they got one of those uh <clears throat> one of those throttle bodies that mmx sells where it's just basically cut up on the anyway you know which one i'm talking about and they call it ported it ain't ported um but this one would really benefit from that um sorry saying it's a jet intake yep Pat saying, man, I don't know about that. I think of thermostat change outs the same way I think about throttle body replacements. You know, like I say, I've got data to back it up. And um, it's it's just kind of one of those weird things where, um, you know, I get it. I'm kind of in the same boat. That's why I chased the data for so many passes. And it was weird, too, because it it. You know, I would come into the traps at say a hundred. I'm sorry, into the into the water box at say 165 degrees. Do the burnout. <clears throat> get the car staged. By the time I launch, it's sitting at like 180 ish, 175, 180. Make the pass, and I mean, I kid you not, as it's going through the power suite, right at 194, it would start a little bit of short term knock retard, but at 192, it wouldn't. Um, so just something to consider, but it would do that over and over and over again. Kind of weird. Tuxedo is asking, what is my dream car? I already told you mine from the previous live video and it's the Dodge Charger SRT Hellcat. My second dream car is 2017 Ford F-150 Raptor. Um, uh, uh, do I know the vehicle? I know it real well. As a matter of fact, one of my neighbors has one. Um, my dream car, the thing is, is it depends on what we're talking about, what dream I'm having at that moment. Um, but I've got a lot of them. I've got a lot of different dream cars and my first one is going to be my Hellcat. I really like that car a lot. It does everything that I would want the car to do. Now, aside from that, what would be out there? Man, there's some classics that I really like. Uh, Mark III Lincoln would be pretty cool to have. It's big block, um, you know, a little bit of work done to that thing, and it can be a monster. I, but there's some other cool things. Obviously, the old Savoys are a big deal for me. Um, you know, growing up, always loved the Corvettes. Um, you know, Daytona Cobra would be another one. There's a, there's a lot of them that are out there, but again, it just depends on what kind of mood you're in. Uh, love the 58 DeSoto. 58 DeSoto is one of my favorite cars ever. So there's that one to consider. Uh, just so many of them that are out there. The more modern, modern stuff, man, I don't know. It's, it's tough to say. Depends on what I'd be doing with the car too. So I'm saying shifts like a bad 3D print. 
Uh, Boo saying, why does my Hellcat ECT read 185 on the gauge and 165? <laughs> okay, <laughs> good question. So, okay, uh, for you guys that don't know what he's talking about, this is so awesome. I'm glad you brought this up. You brought it at the perfect time because so we're talking about thermostats. Um, there, for whatever reason, and I don't know what it is, the... By the way, another good question is, why is it that my intake air temp and my supercharger coolant temp are flip-flopped in my Uconnect? Anyway, um, I, I just kind of a personality trait there. But anyway, if you've got one of these lower temp thermostats, what will happen is, is it will show on the gauge, it'll raise just fine. And it'll raise, it'll, you know, it'll go 104, 110, whatever, 170, 175, 180, 185. And then it'll get to where it'll the 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 uh, <laughs> it'll get where the thermostat opens up, and that will start this this uh, kind of an ebb and flow where your your temperature will more or less stabilize. Well, the thing is, it stabilizes down, and the temperature gauge won't follow it down. It'll stick at one eighty five. So when I'm doing my data logs, my data log will show one seventy two. 175 somewhere in that range with that 170 thermostat going down the highway <laughs> it still says 185 i have no idea man i'm still trying to figure that out um nobody can answer the question for me uh it's not like the gauge won't show 170 i mean it's right there it shows it as it's warming up but why it won't show it on a stable on a stable run, I have no idea. Couldn't tell you. Um, it, there's got to be there's probably a uh, a modifier in there for some table that we just don't have access to. You got to remember there are thousands of lines of code with thousands of different uh, if then statements going on with tables that you don't even have and I wouldn't ever have a clue that exist in there. Predictive shift algorithm is the big one. I know uh, multiple Mopars has access to all of that, but, you know, it's just a matter of <laughs> there's a lot more to it than just that. But anyway, um, but yeah, I don't know, man. That's something that <laughs> I'm going down the road going 185 and I'm looking at my data going it's 172, not 185. I first saw that, by the way, in quick, a quick bricks charger. Uh <laughs> I don't know, man. It's a trip, though, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> boosted him. He's saying HP tuners. I know, right? <clears throat> I don't know. Like I say, it's something in the subroutine. I can't I can't answer that question, brother. I wish I could. Um, Hot Rod's saying it seems uh, that Roots and Centrifugal Supercharger, uh, su uh, Centrifugals have some dyno horsepower at same boost, but the Centrifugals show less torque. What is X1H for that? How does it affect performance? So actually a centrifugal will show horsepower um, higher up in the RPM range because of how it produces power and the fact that it has lower inertial draw, which is to say that it takes its less mass to actually turn. Um, so less parasitic loss means more power up top. The way that a Positive displacements, and this is a good opportunity to talk about superchargers as far as the mods that, that work. Now we have gone way past, by the way, guys, we've gone way, way past the cheap and easy stuff. I mean, camshafts and uh, superchargers, nitrous kits, uh, rear end swaps can come into the play of this. You've got to know what you're doing or take it to somebody like Dr. Differential. They know what they're doing. Let them do what they do for a living and get this stuff installed for you. Get it tuned for you so that it all works together properly. Um, so getting back to it, though, the reason why they make power differently is that when a when a root, I don't have a supercharger in here, when a root supercharger turns, when it makes the turn, it is depositing, if you will, it's taking air and it, they actually turn this way. When, when they are taking that air and they're drawing it down around the case and driving it into the intake, it is a measured amount of air. Think of it like it is uh, like a like think of it like it's throwing tennis balls full of air into the engine at some rate. It's it's literally a positive displacement, a metered amount of air 
every time that supercharger turns, regardless of how fast it's turning. So it doesn't matter if that supercharger is turning at 14, 15,000 RPM, the way that a stock Hellcat turns, or if it's sitting there and you're just turning it with your wrist like this. It is the exact same amount of air coming out of the discharge port. It's just how fast is it coming out? Is it coming out really, 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 really fast or just going, through, through, see what I mean? Uh, so, which means that whenever you open the throttle up, this positive displacement is now deposited into the engine. Basically, it is instant boost. It's instant air being shoved into the engine at whatever rate that your pulley ratio is. The centrifugal supercharger is a little bit different. The advantage of a centrifugal supercharger is that it is significantly lighter. Its internals are lighter um, and it's got a better ability to make boost up top just with the way that it's designed. The root supercharger has a lot of parasitic loss. The, the lobes themselves are heavy. They retain a lot of heat. Um, there's a lot of inertial draw there, and it's also dragging a lot of air along with it, as well as heating up the air a lot more. So there's more parasitic loss, but the benefit to a roots blower, when I say roots, I just mean positive displacement in general, <clears throat> is that it has very good average power production. It may not win as far as top horsepower, but it'll make power pretty much all the way across the power band, which is really what you want uh, for, a, for a car, something that's on the road. Now, a centrifugal supercharger, which would be the same, it, it's a, a, the same type of supercharger that you'd find in airplanes that are supercharged. Um, most Airplane engines now are turbocharged, but if it does have a supercharger, it will be a centrifugal supercharger. No doubt about that because they're, again, lighter and all this other stuff. Um, they don't have a specific amount of air that they give at low RPM. There's just not a lot of velocity there. And since it's basically relying on the air being able to be drug in and then centrifugally accelerated and, and pumped into the engine that way, it relies on RPM to build boost. So what the centrifugal supercharger will do is the faster the engines turn, the faster the supercharger turns, the more air it can pump into the engine. So its boost curve is a little bit different in terms of the shape of it, so to speak. As the engine accelerates and is going through its power curve, that centrifugal supercharger will keep adding and adding and adding and stacking and stacking and stacking the boost as it's traveling through the power band. That's why your torque curve will actually shift. Well, from your point of view, it shifts to the right, meaning that your torque is going to be moved further out and your horsepower is moved further out. That's why the feeling of driving the two types of superchargers is so different. The positive displacement gives you boost right now um, at the expense of lower horsepower up top, but just a, a much more broad power band. Whereas the centrifugal supercharger does really well in steady state, like in an airplane or something like that, or in a situation where you're spinning the engine really high, that's where that supercharger does really well. So that's the difference really in terms of how they work. Now, which one is more fun to drive, right? Because that's really the reason why you're spending the kind of money. Uh, most OEs, in fact, all OEs use, if they use superchargers, they use a positive displacement style supercharger, whether it's roots, twin screws, something along those lines. Um, there have been some centrifugal superchargers over the years, and you can pull a centrifugal supercharger to have boost right now too. Don't think that you can't. There's just some physical limitations as far as being able to do that belt slip and things like that. Unless it's gear driven, uh, you can run into some weird uh, packaging issues with them as well uh, to get them to really work like that. Different impeller designs and things like that will uh, serve to make some centrifugal superchargers make better power down low. Torque storms like that. The old Powerdyne superchargers were like that. Um, but then they run out of efficiency fairly early, which means that they just basically start chopping at the air. And that's where, you know, once you get to that point with a supercharger, you just run outside of its efficiency range. So definitely some things to consider. If you're looking to install a supercharger on your car, uh, 
I would always argue that the E-Force kit from Edelbrock, and again, I, I, I would love to be sponsored by them for as many times as I talk about their, their supercharger kits. But um, the fact of the matter is that's a very clean install. It replaces your intake manifold with another component. It's not an add-on component, <clears throat> which means it's, uh, again, a very clean installation. And you get power pretty much everywhere. And if you've got a 5.7, it's on par basically with what a 392 will lay down on the dyno. Um, a, a Pro Charger, a.k.a. Centrifugal Supercharger, could be a Torque Storm, Vortec, Paxton, Pro Charger, take your pick. Um, the big downside to those with these big Hemis is that these barges have got to have torque to get them moving. And when you put a centrifugal supercharger on one of these cars, there's going to be, it, it, they, you never really feel the power the way that you do with a positive displacement supercharger. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that you your tip in torque is basically still the same, but you're also, spit, now you're spinning a supercharger that's creating, that's generating heat. And you can actually, under partial throttle, lose power with those things. So just know that they work really well at wide open throttle. They don't do all that great when they're throttled. But all things considered, a fun factor. Each Actually, you know what? And the other side to it, too, is that each supercharger has platforms that it, they work better with. Um, Coyotes love them some Pro Charger. The 392s, because of packaging, Man, everyone that I've driven, except for maybe one or two, have been a little bit lackluster. And the only reason why I say that is because you never really feel it. It's just, it just builds power and then it shifts. It builds power and then it shifts, kind of like the way that they did stock. It's just a little bit better accentuation on the big end, say 4,000 RPM and up. Let's see. Oh, Sambo saying, hey, B, can you explain to me how to read KPA wide open throttle and when you key on the car to check the barometric pressure? Absolutely. So when you go into your PIDs that you want to, um, and most, actually, the, the HP Tuner's uh, stock uh, config file, config file is just a fart smelling way of saying the stuff that you're monitoring, uh, but your stock config file is typically going to have barometric pressure and KPA listed. Um, and basically, KPA is going to, you're, you're looking at wide open throttle, you're going to look for a KPA, and it depends on how you like to read it. Some guys like inches of mercury. I like kilopascals <clears throat> because it's running off of a 100 base. It's kind of like the, it's well, it's the the metric version of how you would read this stuff. But um, if you're used to carburetors, you'll want to read it in inches of mercury. Um, other guys will read it in bar. But the, the main thing that you're looking at is um, you're looking at, so for example, 100 kPa would be normal atmospheric pressure. And what you would do to check whatever atmospheric pressure is, is just key on and run and don't start the car and start your data log. Look at your kPa and that'll give you an idea as far as where you're at. Uh, you can also log barometric pressure as well. Um, and logging actual barometric pressure will give you what the car is showing barometric pressure to actually be. And in my config file, I have them stacked. I've got KPA and then I've got the barometric pressure right underneath it. Um, but that's how you would do it. And KPA, again, you're going to read it in terms of percentages of 100 um, and really, it's percentages of what your barometric pressure is reading in KPA. If you're boosted, just remember that you are measuring the actual atmospheric pressure, including ambient air pressure. So it will always be, like, say, for example, if we're just going to you know, baseline it, it will always be 14.7 barometric pressure outside. What you're reading is you're reading a percentage of barometric pressure in the intake manifold itself under certain whatever parameters that you're that you're reading so to take that a step farther kind of a, a quick you know kentucky windage way to to get your your boost number out of the thing 
is let's say you're playing with a boosted car and you're just looking to see what about what kind of boost is this thing making. And there, you can actually configure HP tuners to give you manifold pressure based on this. You just have to create the config file or create the PID, I should say. But if you are if you have 150 KPA, 150 KPA, that would mean that you have barometric pressure, which is 100. Remember, because that's 100 is what we breathe, um, which you would validate with your barometric pressure pressure reading, which if you're at high altitude, it'll be lower, but you get the idea. And you're going to base it off of that number. You're basically basing all these figures off of your Barrow number. Uh, but let's say you're at sea level and you have 100 kPa as your atmospheric pressure. And at 150 is what you're reading at wide open throttle. And that's the boost that you're looking at. So you would take it's 50% more than 100. So you take 14.7, which is your known generic atmospheric pressure, and you multiply it by 0.5 because you have added basically half of the barometric pressure that you have. You've crammed half of that back into the engine, and now you basically have, you know, seven or eight pounds of boost, give or take. So that's kind of a like a real quick sleight of hand way of finding out how much boost the thing is making. And I know that when you create the PID, that's the way that it shows boost. Now, when you're reading it, if you read it in PSI, it will show, uh, it'll show a, like a intake, uh, intake manifold pressure will be like 23 PSI. Um, or 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Yeah, 22 or 23 PSI. Um, I know I completely didn't lose my mind there. That's not, you're not making 23 pounds of boost. You would just subtract 14.7 from that. So hopefully that answers your question on how to read it and what to look for when you're looking at that. Uh, scavenger saying, I have a fast man throttle body on my O2 Ram with a 360. Uh, a long time ago, if I get one again, I'll be getting one of his again. Very good throttle body. I've been saying that they, you know, I've been recommending those for a long time, right up until I got a chance to play with uh, Dr. Diff's throttle bodies. And yeah, I would probably go that route now. Uh, oh, now they're saying, I run a fast man throttle body and some other throttle bodies and the fast man had the best track numbers. Some do. Uh, some are saying, hit that like button. Yeah, hit that like button. Like, subscribe, share, call your friends, tell them to get on there. Right now, uh, LS Swap everything is saying, I didn't know Texas Speed made stuff for Hellcats. Uh, they do. Uh, LS Swap saying, know of anyone with experience with their products for Hellcats? Yes. Call Dr. Differential and Speed. <laughs> so um, we Doc Differential uses uh, Texas Speed cores for the camshaft program. So um, it's you know, the, the in-house only grinds, but yes, that we have uh, custom grinds for Hellcats and, uh, or if you don't like the way that that's going, you can always just get one straight from uh, Texas Speed, but I would definitely talk to somebody who has worked with them to get an idea for the right cam for your application. And I'm going to stop right there. If you've got a Hellcat and you're thinking about putting a cam in it, you had better also have a pulley ready to go. You need to have not necessarily long tubes, but you need to be talking to somebody who's done cams and Hellcats before. And the reason why I say that is because it is very easy to screw up a perfectly good and serviceable Hellcat by just putting a cam in there. Positive displacement superchargers in cars that weigh as much as these do with compression as low as it is, you need to know what's going on with that engine before you just pick something off of a shelf. The reason why I say that is because if you get too aggressive with that cam, that cam is going to be begging for cylinder pressure. It's going to be dying for cylinder pressure. When you put a cam in that car, it kills cylinder pressure. You go, well, yeah, but you're making more power with less boost. What can, what, why, what's the, what's the bitch? What's the problem? I'll tell you the problem. 
The problem is, is that when you do that, you run into the same problems that you will naturally aspirated, which is that you give up all of that sweet, luscious torque on tip in and all of the power down low says bye bye. And it kind of comes back somewhere up top. The trick to superchargers and camshafts is you don't run less boost. This isn't a turbo. This is a positive displacement supercharger. The way that they work is completely different. <clears throat> the trick is to get your boost back. Put the cam in the car, put the boost in the car, run the same boost that you had, but retain the tip end throttle response and pick up horsepower in wholesale quantities. Don't just try to do it with a cam. I've seen, I, I can already tell you how this is going to end and it ain't cool. So just know that coming into it. Give Dr. Diff a shout. He'll walk you through everything you need to know. But the short answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> 76239 saying, what's your opinion on the Hyundai Genesis 5.0 TAU V8 similar to the 16 to 18 Coyote engine? It is, but just not quite as much power. I will say this, though. Everybody that I know of, and I I will happily admit that I know quite a few people that have started to go to that platform. Love it, love it, love it, love it. I don't have any real experience myself, but those that have bought that car love that car. And I, I mean, for every reason under the sun that there is to like them. So just know that coming into it. Uh, let's see. Anyway, hopefully that answered some questions, by the way. I know we always get a little bit sidetracked. You know, I can only go so long without going completely, you know, squirrel. But hopefully that answered some questions for you guys, though, as far as uh, positive displacement and centrifugal superchargers and just superchargers in general and my recommendations for what works and and you know what's not going to work when it comes to these hemis uh you've got to have a plan in place and i guess that's really i need to kind of circle back around to that you've got to have a plan in place um and, and guys just understand that if, if you're trying to build something for like highway hits and things like that you can definitely build something fast out of the Mopars that'll that'll run just fine. They'll, they'll, they're all pretty much in the same ballpark. I know that the the Coyote is the most dreaded thing out there when it comes to highway hits, but um, a little bit of cam, a little bit of boost uh, will definitely go a long way. Uh oh, that's the sign of the police. Anyway, um. Huh. Um, so what you're looking at though is you realistically is go with something that's going to be fun go with something that's going to package well and if you want to make a ton of power just know that your options are going to be limited with these heavy heavy cars and this is what I, I just didn't get to that in in this amount of time but these heavy cars are spending a lot of time at top dead center high cylinder pressures keep the boost conservative the Hellcat guys, y'all can, y'all don't have to worry about this, but keep the boost conservative, whether you've got a 5.7 or a 6.4, we've seen them both blow up. Um, but check that, that ring gap. That's going to be one of the most important things because you've got a lot of weight with a lot of cylinder pressure, trying to get the inertia just moving at any point with these things. That's what pops a ring land. So just know that coming into this conversation, if you've got one of the naturally aspirated variants, you're going to, if you want to make a significant amount of power, this is something that you're going to have to address. PBR Day saying, hey, be loving the Mopar check. Got the arm flex. Thank you, brother. I like it. Uh, best exhaust setup for less drone in the cab. So if you're going to start putting a different exhaust in the car, what I would suggest doing, this is what I would do, but this is not what I have done. So this is one of those do what I say, not what I do kind of moments. Um, get rid of the rear resonators and put like a race bullet back there or something like that. Whether it's a, it's a 392 car or a Hellcat, definitely if you've got a Hellcat, you might want to consider this. I didn't. I just went with the um, the Pipes Rezo Delete Kit. Um, if you need help installing that, I've got a 
pretty decent video. It's not the best, but it's a, it's a video that will go you through measurements and things like that if you're planning on doing that. I did mine more for the aesthetic. It lost a little bit of weight in the process, but I did it more for the aesthetic. Um, but let me just tell you guys this. The, the drone with that kit isn't that bad, and it just sounds like it has a performance exhaust system on it. There are a couple of them that are out there that are aftermarket that do a pretty good job. I think it's the Corsa kit uh, and the Magnaflow kits do a pretty good job of keeping them pretty well shut up. But um, I would just say, look, man, just throw some race bullets back there just to help to keep the drone down. It opens them up a little bit, you know, it just it it's a good setup. It's not bad. But no matter what you do, if you go in there and you're you're replacing a lot of different parts, you're still going to get some level of uh, drone. But for me, it's just a little bit louder and, and I like the way it sounds. So. But that would be my my suggestion is just chop off the resos, put a race bullet back there and you should be in good shape. If you don't like the loud drone, Arthur's saying, uh, what up, B. Mason? Got the ball headed guy with the shades and the arm flex. I like it. Ellis swaps in drone in the cab, sound deadener. Wish it worked that well. Uh, oh, Pat's saying it's just the lifter is having to repump. Maybe, it could be, um, but I would definitely check the oil. And a lot of times they'll do that if you're going too far in between um, oil change intervals. So just know that coming into it too. Arthur Wall saying Tal V8 is potent, the five liter and the revised four six. Yeah, like I say, I know that uh, everybody that's got one of those loves it. So, so, so saying, did Hyundai and Ford both change their V8 from 4.6 to 5.0? Did they work together? Um, Arthur's saying that they're not related um, to the supercharged V8 and the Jag. Let's see. Oh, the, the Coyote is related to that. Yeah, no, they're definitely not um, related. But I will say that they do work well. I want to say that Hyundai has had a five liter now for a while. Dr. Joe saying, speaking of tires, we launched pops on those MT Street SSs at 4,000 RPM today, and she wiggled uh, to the right and rolled out. Best hook it's ever done. I'm afraid of the drive shaft and axles. It hooks hard. Ah, send it, man. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I'm glad y'all are having fun with it. Remember, those are record setting wheel and tire combinations you've got on that car. Um, Oh, 76239 saying the 5 has the higher compression than the old uh, Coyote did. Yeah, what was funny is that uh, it may have been about the same time that the Hyundai 5 liter was about the same horsepower ish as that 5 liter. I remember that. It's going back a ways. I was saying, cool, I will hit up Dr. Diff then. Yes, absolutely. Oh, and then there's Dr. Diff saying he drove Sierra. Good to hear. Very happy to hear that. Um, Oh, uh, Sovereign saying they use the Julia platform for the Dart, if I'm not mistaken. No, the Dart was a different platform. The Julia's front engine rear drive specific. Um, Dr. Div saying with six and a half PSI. What did I miss? Oh, six and a half PSI of uh, fuel pressure. Oh, very good. Excellent. Yeah, give me a shout tomorrow, man. I'd love to hear the hear the details on that. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me give you some details on my end, too. <laughs> Next. Uh, that project may have been pushed up a little bit. Uh, LS Swap saying nothing is too small for a V8. Frostbite saying I love my 180 Mylodon. Very cool. Oh, LS saying look at the Miata. So the funny thing about the Miata is that when I was in college, uh, that's back when Monster Miata was, was a big deal. And somebody at the college had a Monster Miata. Now, if you're not familiar with what that is, that is a Miata with a five liter Windsor. And basically the, the idea was that you would find a Miata and Monster, I don't think they made kits. I think you had to run the car through Monster, would swap the five liters engine transmission, the harnesses and all that other stuff into the car. You had supercharger options and all that other kind of stuff, but uh, kind, of a, kind of a cool setup for back in the day. Uh, let's see. <laughs> let's swap big block bar stools. 
I, it's funny you mentioned that too. I saw something on those the other day. Barstool racing. Uh, Chris is saying, would you recommend the Hellcat lower box imported throttle body on a stock tuned 392? Yeah, uh, for sure. So that's, again, that's one of those day two type of mods that you can do with these uh, challengers specifically. Uh, primarily because the swap, I mean, there's really nothing to it. You get the air filter, you get the lower box. It's basically remove, install, done deal. I mean, you won't, really won't even get your hands dirty um, with the swap. And the ported throttle body, yes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out there to you. Um, get the right throttle body. Don't get one of the ones that they they take the throttle body and just cut and, you know, I don't even know what you would call it. It's like, it's the like bell mouth, both ends of the throttle body. It's like that. Why? What's the point? I mean, I understand the point because you're bell mouthing it, but it's, it's not like it's pronounced or anything. I mean, typically a bell mouth is going to be like, if you've got a, a, an opening that's the size of the bottom of this taco bell cut, you're going to be bell mouthed to about the size of the top of this thing. I mean, that's usually the how you're going to bell mouth it. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. The reality is that you've got, uh, man, I, I could, only a couple of throttle body sizes that will actually work for it. So again, give doc, Dr. Differential a shout. He's got an 85 millimeter that will work really well with a ported manifold, which I highly recommend if you're even going to mess with a throttle body. You might as well get your manifold done. And yeah, it's more expensive, but you'll know where your money's been spent because you'll actually get something out of that throttle body. And I'll take that a step farther. Um, you know, I'll I'll tell you that uh, if, if you're going to go with a ported throttle body, again, the 84 is about as big as you can go. Uh 84 to 85, but you really won't get that much out of it unless you've got your manifold ported. And I know this because, again, as y'all know, getting to be that time of year, <laughs> I just got through porting this thing. So I can tell you why. I mean, I, I, I do this. So, I mean, I can tell you exactly why that throttle body just really won't help anything. And 80 millimeter is not a small throttle body. It'll manage quite a bit of power. Um, but if you put a bigger throttle body on it, you're still dealing with the smaller, more, uh, well, I, I say restrictive, that's kind of a misnomer. It's not going to flow as well as it would when it's ported. You're just not going to get the most out of it. So there's that. And again, a lot of the, the performance gains that you get with the 6.4, um, Again, depending on how jacked up the runners are at the seams, but most of the performance gain that you get is in that in the throat of those manifolds. Thank you very much again, Dr. Diff. I appreciate it, brother. Um, Bo's saying the calculated manifold air temp is based off ECT and IAT. So if ECT is lower, uh, that keeps the manifold air temperature lower, avoids pulling timing by knock retard or hot spark. The thing is, is that um, so knock retard is based on the knock sensor voltage, which is based on an RPM modifier. Um, but it's, it's still pulling off of the same table. Hot spark, on the other hand, won't show as pulling timing. It'll only show as having less timing. Um, and again, that's run off of whichever pivot uh, temperature that you're running in your tune. Most people don't really mess with that. They'll only mess with the tables themselves um, when they're adjusting spark modifiers. But the reality is that, you know, I'm looking at knock retard and it's based specifically on knock sensor voltage, right? But even when the knock sensor voltage was low, it would still pull it. And again, there's no, there's no way to look at what even with when you're longing uh uh fast uh let's see fast pass slow path it's not going to tell you where it's pulling the timing value from so you just have to kind of know it coming into it and in this case it was actual knock retard so um 
again, that's going to come into a subroutine and it probably ha it's obviously having something to do with temperatures and things like that. But when I dropped the temp, car was a lot happier and it's a lot more consistent too. Um, Oh, Ellis Swap's hanging out with Sovereign. Dr. Diff's saying, me too. Yes, uh, not cost efficient. Dr. Diff's saying, I've got one ordered for you. Nice. I just ordered a bunch. Cost me over two grand. Hard to do that for a stock item, for sure. But they will sell. Absolutely. Um, yeah, those are, I mean, they're like freaking pieces of jewelry. Sovereign, I'm saying, uh, oh, he's hanging out with Ellis Swap. Um, talking about that, uh, that platform frostbite ram saying i need one give dr diff a shout uh oh uh pat saying my dream car is a 1970 dodge super b i had back in the day mostly mopars but i wouldn't mind a 32 deuce uh an american graffiti or the mad max interceptor funny thing about the interceptors is that um you can you know mad max cars is the name of the company that brings in the the falcons 71 through 74 XB. And uh, and you can build one uh, or just bring in the Falcon coupes because they're over 25 years old. Um, so there's that. But I, I man, I don't know. See, I, I had a Roadrunner sold out from underneath me a long, long, long time ago. Um, so that's always going to be the one that got away. No matter what cars I've had, I've always kind of been partial to the, the B-body Mopars. Um, and man, I came so close about two years, maybe three years ago, probably closer to three years ago, came extremely close to buying a, uh, 69 center console 383 car, um, Roadrunner. But, uh, I just couldn't pull the trigger at the time, but yeah, man, I, I love to get my hands on one, but see, here's the problem. And Dr. Diff will know exactly what I'm talking about here. So I love the classics. Don't get me wrong. I really do. But there is a certain level of acceptance that you have to get to with these classics. And I'm, the most simple and easiest and all of that, however you want to call it, of tasks can turn into a nine carat, like third level of hell pain in the ass with those older cars when you're dealing with modern fuel, trying to make a fuel system work for them. You've got all these other crazy things that can potentially go wrong that you would never see coming. I would never see coming. I mean, I look at it and go, it just seems easy. The reality is that it's not. Living with a classic is a pain in the ass. And like, for example, Sierra, that car, truck, I'm sorry, just sitting in the driveway, brake line failed. Then another brake line failed. So I'm out there replacing that stuff. Joy. Radiator fails. So I put a new radiator in it. And the list goes on and on. Oh, by the way, did you ever find out what was behind that pulley? Uh, anyway, Doc Diff knows what I'm talking about. Um, that's going to be a yours truly screw up, by the way, if that's what I think it is. Um, but um, anyway, there's there's so many little things that can go wrong with those cars. And although you can get a lot of the parts today, you cannot get a lot of the parts. And if, unless you're playing with a uh, very well-supported uh, platform, it gets even worse. And so I've got a 1972 GMC C25. It is a three-quarter ton GMC. And you would think that between Brothers and LMC Truck and God only knows where else, you'd be able to find parts for that thing just laying. And I'm in Texas for crying out loud. You'd think you just walk outside and trip over parts for this truck, right? It doesn't quite work like that. And the problem is they made rolling changes practically every year with those things. So it's like, well, you can't just use something, this one part off of a 71. I tell you what, inline tube saved my ass on more than one occasion on that truck with the brake lines because I got a hold of one of the guys and one of the gals over there, and she knew her shit and he knew his shit. And I'm telling you right now, they're like, no, 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 you don't want that part. That's the exact wrong part. You know, they made this certain change in 1971 that did, the, and I'm just going, thank God you know what you're talking about. It's just so weird stuff like that. But yeah, I hear you, man. I, kind of digress a little bit and got into some of that. But the, another car 
that I tried to buy and the guy wouldn't sell to me was a was it 69 or 70 AMX with the 401. I always loved the AMXs. And this is when I lived in California. And the guy literally lived right like I lived in San Bruno and it was like right around the, the top of the hill from me where he lived. And I tried, I mean, I tried uh, at least three times. It might've been four to buy that car and he never did sell it to me. Anyway, I would love to have that thing, especially today. Can we swap that thing? Oh yeah. Uh, doctor was saying, keep in stock. I'm saying lost before a bit back now. Oh, here we go. Uh, Oh, Sovereign saying shift like a bad 3D print was in reference to the, the core shift. Well, what's funny is that they it, they will. They'll they'll core shift all over the place. It's like smashing a, a ham sandwich together. Things just kind of slide around when they do that. Um, but yeah, very good point on that. Let's see. Uh, Frederick's checking in and saying, what's popping, B? What's up, man? Let's see. Oh, uh, Ellis is still hanging out with Sovereign. Let's see. Tuxedo is asking, what color is your Charger, Challenger, Hellcat, whatever? My mother's is 2016 RAV4 is blue. Also my car too. Uh, mine is a color called Redline Red. It's a, uh, it's a red metallic color that uh, is looks darker at night than it does during the day. It's a real pretty like dark red during the day, and it looks kind of a like a maroon almost at night. So we're not saying, oh no, <laughs> gulps of air pockets, low in torque. <clears throat> torque storm for the win, great budget boost, really good supercharger. The, the torque storm would be, for you old school guys out there, uh, would be very synonymous with like an old ball drive Paxton or a power dime would have been in the 90s. So I'm saying I'll opt in for the low end torque for sure. Pat saying, what do you think of replacing the belly plan with a police car replacement? Sometimes they're metal, sometimes plastic, but they have air ducts for brakes. It won't make a difference. It really won't. That's, I mean, I don't see that being any helping at all, if it, if it does anything. And the reason why I say that <clears throat> is because the SRT cars all have uh, cold air brake ducts uh, for the brakes, and they don't, they don't do anything. Oh, Pat saying Edelbrock Rock rocks. Yeah, they do. Say so ever since the 80s, for sure. Yeah, they've been around forever since the 50s, actually. Um, oh, Rips. Yeah, Rips a good uh, a good one to ask on this too. Saying he does not like the feel of the Pro Charger on a 616 speed. You know, that's one of the. It's funny that you mentioned that, and I'm glad that you did too. Um, is you to to really get a lot out of a centrifugal supercharger, you have got to pulley the heck out of that thing. Um, I hate to say it, but unless you're making about 10 or 12 pounds with a centrifugal supercharger, I'm not going to say that it's not worth it. It, it, it. it is worth it. All right. And at seven PSI, you're still looking at making at least another 120 to 130 horsepower. And you think, well, man, that sounds like a lot. Well, not really. Not 125 horsepower isn't much when you're already putting down 430 to the rear wheels. The percentage amount just isn't all that high. You know, back in the day, you get a five liter Mustang, you put a blower on it, you pick up 100 horsepower. That's a 50% horsepower gain. Um, you do the same to one of these cars today, and they just, they're not going to pick up like that. Um, at least not in hold together. So that will at least give you an idea as far as, you know, what you can expect out of them. You know, that five to six pound boost range is going to be about, you know, 100-ish horsepower, 125-ish horsepower to the rear wheels. Um, so he liked it on his 6.1 Auto, though. Sovereign saying, I just leave the 6.4 stock. Yeah, well... Thing is, if you've got money burning a hole in your pocket, it makes it kind of tough to say to leave it stock. 
Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, Donnie's saying, uh, decided that this summer I'm going to start getting into the tuning scene, ordered some of the materials from HP Tuners, also taking some courses specific to the Hemi. Wish me luck. It's just, it, you, brother, you don't need luck. It, it's, if you're putting the work in, it'll, you'll pick up on it. It's just like learning a new language. In fact, in a lot of ways, it is like learning a new language. you got a bell curve. It's going to be, what did I get myself into? And then you'll start to understand, and that's about the time you get real dangerous. Um, but yeah, just the, take it slow. Um, and the cool thing is, I mean, you got your own car, you can sit there and play with, just remember that, uh, you know, stay within the recipe, so to speak, and you'll be in good shape. Oh, and, and Rift is going to be doing the same thing. Yeah. So I'm saying 47 watchers, only 36 likes hit that like button peeps for sure. Let's see. Bear with me just a second. Hang on. All right. Uh, oh, Riff's saying the only thing he's messed with is the torque command. Yeah, that, you, you may learn the light switch effect that that could possibly have on your car, too. Um, White Knuckles saying, good evening to me. I was just looking at the 2020 NHRA rule book, and when I got to 1149 and faster, showing six-point cage is necessary. Uh, didn't that used to be 999 or faster need a cage? So, yeah, the 1149, if the car has any hole in the roof, if it's got a sunroof or it's a convertible or something along those lines, that's when, if I'm not mistaken, you have to have a cage per the rules but no nines is where it's at as a matter of fact um uh, look uh, look for the 2021 rule book uh, i know that when they were talking about making the switches they were talking about 2021 but it's been oh you know what last year's might have still been 1149 so yeah there i know that for 21 they're like no just let it let it ride because there's so many cars now that run nines and i mean you're gonna tell them they can't run at the drag strip come on you're saying they can't run at the drag strip you're telling them to go run on the street oh doc diff is saying if anybody needs a config file um i can put a generic one up for you uh just need to know where uh just where to set it up and that anyone can pick up the ve layout and channel config very cool Riff saying it's $9.99 here in Cali. Can't find the new law that you were talking about saying I can go faster than without a cage. So it may not be published, but my understanding is when they had the meeting this past, what was it, December, that they were looking to lower the number to $9.49. So that's what I was told. The mile an hour is still going to be the same at $150 uh, for laundry for the parachute, but that the cage was going to be lowered to $9.49. That's just what I had heard. That's what I was told. Oh, Donnie's saying, I would appreciate that, Dr. Diff, uh, for that info. Dane's saying, hey, Dr. Diff, uh, I'll ask if he's got a link for the throttle body. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm saying Popo on the go. Yep. Oh, Dane's uh, at Dr. Diffin for a uh, throttle body for a 392 Whipple build. Any suggestions? I like that. Uh, let's see. Oh, Rift saying <laughs> apparently there was a sideshow and a lot of folks got towed. Hey, man. Uh, so when I used to live in NorCal, sideshow was a real thing. Roll into Oakland, man. You'll see that stuff on a weekly or a daily basis every week. Uh, C-Man714 saying, just bought a Challenger Scat Pack today. Very nice. Uh, Dr. Dave's hanging out with Frostbite. So we're not saying uh, congrats to uh, C-Man714. Frostbite saying he's going to go get some get Dr. Diff some data. Very nice. Oh, yeah. Dane, give uh, Dr. Diff a shout on that throttle body. 
Uh, oh, Rift is saying he was going to bring up the Miata with the Hellcat engine. So the, the thing is, is that <clears throat> cars like that, if you've never driven one, like my Cobra, my Mark III Superformance with the big block, that car was fun in very small doses. That car with a small block would have been a riot. I probably never would have gotten rid of it, but with a big block, it was a case of never meet your heroes. That car was just way too much. I, I mean, that thing was, it was constantly trying to swap ends. So, I mean, the thing didn't weigh anything with a big block. Oh, Pat saying he had a 93 Monster Miata after getting rid of my non-intercooled Grady. Uh, totally ruins the handling and worth every penny. Absolutely it does. And absolutely it is. <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility, says Sovereign. Um I was saying that's why I don't play around with the sideshow for sure. Yeah, I, I, I never mess with it. it. Too many, I mean, every one that I ever saw in person, somebody curb check, you know, something. I, I've never seen one go go well. But I mean, I'm, I'm also the same guy that'll get out and cheer them on. So <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm just kind of messed up like that. Um, uh, see, man, saying he's taking it slow. Yeah, well. That 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 won't last long. Let's see. Let's see. Sovereign's hanging out with C. I was saying that. Yeah, Sovereign's saying I have no doubt the throwback and seats intoxicating. It it is, but it isn't because what ends up happening is that you get this weird odd sensation in fourth gear. And it's in fourth gear where things get real spooky. So the Cobra would on roll on a roll on would haze the tires in fourth gear. And when you've got a car with a wheelbase that's about that wide or that long, rather, things get a little bit iffy pretty quickly. But yeah, I get it. Trust me. It, 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 it was pretty crazy. But yeah, something like that Miata with a Hellcat is a completely different ballgame. Uh, uh, Catalyst is asking, maybe this is already answered, but can you put a flex tune on 392 so that you can switch back and forth between 93 and 85? So a true flex tune, a flex fuel tune would just do it by itself. You can obviously put two different tunes on a car and switch back and forth, but uh, there is not a, I know that there's people that will argue this and I know that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but anyway, there's not, in my opinion, there's not a reliable, true flex system for the uh, Mopars. Um, oh, Rip is asking, do you think it's worth trying to sell my stock Hellcat diff or do you think nobody would want to want to stock one? Uh, I would think people with RTs would want one. Yeah, maybe, but I mean, it's a 262 and they're going to be looking for a 309. I would keep it because you never know. You just never know. I'm keeping mine. Mine's in my, in my garage. Uh, Ashley's asking, any tips? Ashley Mills, what's up, girl? Saying, any tips on twin turbo tuning? Um, so that is, I will defer that over to Doc Diff. But, um, yeah, I would say that you're probably living through VE table hell right now. Uh, but it shouldn't be that difficult. Uh, especially if you've got a, if you're able to get the car out and drive it and actually load test it a little bit, but, um, without a, any current dyno, it makes it a little bit more difficult. I get it. But, um, let's see, start out with on low boost, obviously. Um, and go from there to get the fueling right first. Once you get your fueling, your fuel trims, right. Uh, start off pulling timing and don't forget to ramp up your, um, well, don't forget to, well, there, there's a lot of things you're going to have to work with on a turbo setup. It's not that much different than a centrifugal supercharger um, in terms of load scaling, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I will defer that over to Doc Diff because <clears throat> I'm not going to step on my business with that one. <laughs> but uh, what fuel, I, the other one thing is what fuel are you going to be running? Um 
but the main thing is just and also how much boost but you're gonna on your uh on your uh, just set power and rich to like you know command like around a, a, a 0.80 lambda you know 11.78 to one ish afr like 801 um, or 805 rather and then for I would say on your wide open throttle timing because everything else is going to be kind of easy to play with uh, but I would I would just flag the entire power and rich table at basically 805 lambda you know 11.78 to 1 and then on wide open throttle I would say you know, if you're running, I mean, the, the the whole system, I can't really give you tips on timing because I don't know what the compression ratio is and RPM range, but, um, you know, load scale that thing out to about, you know, grams per second, like 1.9, 1.75, something like that. Just depends on how much boost you're running. There's so many goofy things you got to get into, though. Take your time. That's the biggest one, patience. Um, Sovereign saying, uh, B body charger and cornet, yeah, for sure. Uh, Pat saying, Oh, trust me, hardened valve seats, uh, to run modern unleaded gas, stupid uh, suspension system on my 73 Red Runner, uh, crappy aftermarket Chinese parts, <laughs> so it's better to run a 50 year old part instead, for sure. Uh, Sovereign saying, AMC Javelin is kind of cool. I always like the AMC stuff, man. So, here's okay for you guys that don't know. Um, AMC cars to look for that you may not have ever heard um, or other cars like from Studebaker. So we all know about the um, the AMX, which is more popular, but you also had, oh hell, what was the other one? Anyway, I'll, it'll cross my mind here in a minute. The sedan, the, the, S, the, the SC Rambler, call it the Scrambler. That was a pretty cool car uh, from AMX. But then Studebaker, had the Daytona and they also had the Studebaker Challenger that you could get with a Paxton supercharger. They had a 289 cubic inch V8, not to be confused with the Ford, but they had an R2 and an R3 uh, power level. And the Challenger and the Avanti with the R3 were some of the fastest cars uh, around back in the golden era of muscle car. I mean, just walk out and just slap the piss out of a big block. So anyway, some really cool cars. A lot of people don't know that there was another Challenger. It was a Studebaker Challenger. And a Studebaker Challenger with an R2 or an R3 uh, supercharger package from the factory was one of the nastiest cars you would really want to ever run up against. Uh, you know, probably the most relevant up until... 68, 69, some of the more hyper big blocks were really making the scene. But anyway, I digress. Uh, oh, Riff saying red line is my favorite color. Ah, that's well it should be. Um, let's see. Just to make sure you don't stay in that color for too long. Boom. Uh, Tuxedo is asking, is your Hellcat easy to drive just like a normal easy car? It really is. In fact, um, yeah, and Rich is saying that his Hellcat put down over 800 bills or eight bills and it drives like a Camry for a daily. They do, man. They, they, that's the reason why, man, it's so hard. People ask, what's my favorite car that I've ever owned? I was like, man, it's really my Hellcat. It drives like a, like a, just an automobile, you know? Um, no real sense of looming danger. It doesn't ever feel like it's going to, really sneak up and bite you in the ass until you get on it. And even then, because of the weight and the stability of the car, you never really feel like it's going to necessarily get out of sorts on you. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would say that it's it's the best of all worlds. I and mean, granted, there, there are a lot of compromises to the car. It's as aerodynamic as a barn. It's heavy like a barge. You know, it needs every freaking pound foot of torque that it's making just to get out of its own way. And I understand all of that, but the stuff that you get, the trade-off from all of that is that it's comfortable. It's big. It handles eerily well. Um, 
you know, just remember, like locally at least, GT2 uh, points leader is in a uh, 392, a stripped down 392 six speed car. So, um, but there's a lot of really cool attributes to them that make them so endearing. You know, it's they're not just fast; they're real comfortable too. So that helps out things a lot. Now, granted, they're no good for roll racing. And, um, I mean, you've got to make a bunch of power to, to make them even remotely competitive from like a 60 to 130 hit. But, and really, even after that, I mean, they're, they're really only, really only strong up until about 150, 155 at the power level that I'm at. After that, it'll it'll keep accelerating to 200 miles an hour, but it'll just take it seemingly forever to get there. By comparison, I should say. Uh, Ruth saying, I heard it would be good to get a flex fuel tune on my Hellcat so I can run regular gas through it every so often just to help lube the engine. So it's good for the injectors, for sure. Um, but just remember, it's not a flex fuel tune. It's an E85 tune. Flex fuel is a descriptive, it's an adjective. Even though the fuel system is called a flex fuel, it is a flexible fuel system uh, as well. So it's not only the, the proper name, but it's also the adjective for what it does, as opposed to a straight E85 tune or a straight gasoline tune. You certainly do that with those cars. A lot of guys do. Uh, but just remember that when you do start messing with that, um, yeah, just don't, don't forget that you've got your, your, you know, your unleaded tune in the car. The problem is that, <clears throat> especially for the boosted guys, the NA guys doesn't really matter, but for the boosted guys, when you start to switch back and forth, if you're just cruising around with that, uh, 93 octane tune, it's going to be pretty well neutered, but there's only so much neutering that you can do. Um, even by retarding timing to make the car just almost just gross to drive. So, uh, but, and, and you can still sting it. So just know that as well. Uh, let's see. Hang on. I was sorry, saying uh, I'm still running the 89 over the 87 gas in the E350, and I think I'm starting to notice something uh, when I'm in sport mode. Before I was feeling delays in throttle response and power, and not now. I don't think it's a placebo effect, even though it says just run 87. Uh, because of your recommendations, I'll try to stick to 89. Some of the more modern cars, um, you can run them just fine on 87 octane. They just fall into a uh, kind of a quagmire of short-term knock retard. I mean, you can data log it and, and see for yourself. Um, but yeah, like for example, my truck seems to like 89 octane. It's bone stock work truck way more than it likes 87 octane um, and likes 93 even more. But even still, I'll get short term knock because it's a truck and they're noisy and they do that. Uh, let's see. Ribs is asking, do they have Pearson ethanol where I live? I don't believe I've ever seen that. Oh, uh, Sovereign saying, Chrysler acquired AMC from uh, Ford Jeep. There was a car named the AMC Spirit. Yes, there was. And I wonder if Dodge used the Spirit name for 9295 Dodge Spirit. Maybe. I don't know. Many saying, hi, y'all. Oh, he's saying it seems that they have the best uh, – uh, ethanol content. So no, we've got Sunoco down here, but there are some stations that it's real hit and miss. Most of them are good, but I mean, there's some Kroger uh, grocery stores down here that have got like, like some of the best E85. So I mean, that's where you get corn, right? But it, they, no kidding. <laughs> Pat saying, go have an IPA already. You, you deserve it. Two hours and going ice. Oh, yeah, we're two hours and 20 minutes into this almost. Uh, let's see. The likes and the views are almost caught up for sure. Got some of you guys hanging out with each other. Let's see. Oh, Riff saying, I just want to point this out. Uh, don't get the bias ply front skinnies. They seem to never work well at the track and always look low on air no matter what. So that is a reason why... 
those were developed by Mickey Thompson. Those are the SRs. Uh, so one of the issues with these cars is that they're just so heavy nowadays. And uh, Hellcats and any of these Mopars need a tire that is a little bit more robust, in my opinion. Now, I don't know of anybody that's ever had a tire failure. Um just due to, you know, the, the fronts being bias plied. But what I will tell you is that when I run those skinnies, I can't really tell that they're on the car. Um, now, granted, I'm cognizant of the fact that they're on the car. I'm not taking any off ramps or on ramps like bonsai style with it, but I braking, turning, just normal car automobile things, it does really well. Uh, whereas the the bias plies get a little bit of, you know, moving aroundy. The other thing that I don't like about bias plies on these cars is that they're independent rear suspension cars. And I just remember running the Viper with uh, ET streets, old school ET streets. Um, I, I never, I never really complained about it, even though that was bias ply all the way around. I also ran bias plies all the way around on the Z06, but for these cars with the weight that they're at, I, I just don't like them. I've watched uh, Racer X's car. I've watched Excessive go down the track and the ass into that car just doing this. I mean, they they it, it'll do a little bit of a bias ply shuffle, which you know will certainly get your attention. Um, so there's that. <laughs> But yeah, no, I always like running radials on something this heavy. It's you're better off to have the stability and the safety, um, in my opinion. But I'm a little bit of a mother hen, and I get that. But just the tires nowadays are so good. I prefer radials anyway now. So uh, Tux is asking, is the 2017 F150 Raptor easy to drive? Oh yeah, um, yeah, they're super. It's just a, they drive just like a normal pickup truck. They're great. <laughs> Cody's saying there are more scat packs and RTs at the dealerships. Interesting. <laughs> Matt's saying Cody, a scat pack is technically an RT nowadays. That's why. Um, Donnie's saying, recently put my RT into storage while I'm at school. It was on E85, got the tank pretty low, and then put in some 91 and let it idle. Hopefully that helps with corrosion. It should. It'll help. It'll certainly help a little bit, depending on how far out you are um, and how long it's going to be sitting. If it's going to be sitting over six months, I would definitely try to get back and run it. Uh, the scavenger's hanging out with Pat. Many say the difference in price between the RT and SCAT is roughly five grand. Some of them really more than that. Saying all of them at the dealership were six four. Scavenger saying, I wish Dallas had Sunokos. I thought they did have Sunokos up there. Maybe they don't. I don't know. You're not missing out on their uh, E85, but I'm telling you, that was pretty rough. Had some weird issues with that. Gone over those stories a few times. Rift, thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. Saying, yeah, I would say with bias ply front runners, it's scary to drive uh, to the track with them on. Keep up the good info, B. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, I used to do it all the time, man. I used to roll everywhere uh, with uh, with the bias ply stuff, man. I just, I would never see myself doing that anymore. Not with one of these heavy cars. I know that Racer X runs around everywhere with his bias ply fronts, and I'm just like, oh, my God. No. Um. Let's see. Got some of y'all hanging out back here. Let's see. Oh, man, he's saying uh, they got the scats factored in pretty low. Uh, upgraded the Hellcat. You pay the extra premium. Yeah, but you still get the, the power bucks, though. <laughs> Cody's saying it's like the five sevens are gone as soon as they're posted. Five sevens are fun cars. Oh, uh, Rift's saying he's got some Hoosier front bias ply, uh, Hoosier bias ply front runners. No matter what, they always seem low on air and squirrely when I try to drive on them. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with the fact they just don't have any sidewall beef to them at all. 
Uh, Sovereign saying, Ray Stark did a good job on the TRX review. I've seen that he did do a review. I just haven't seen it yet. And I have not seen the, the color black eye yet. Vanta black red eye. <laughs> Pat say, what state do I live in? Texas. Cody say, it must be nice to have E85. I have yet to find a gas station that sells E85 here in Vegas. You know, E85 is funny. It's it's great as long as you've got good quality E85. Ship saying, can't wait to try the DBRs on his uh, six-speed manual 392. You're going to love them, man. That those Those tires were made for that car. Well, guys, we are coming up on almost two and a half hours. Um, I have got to get running out of here. Uh, Pat saying, what uh, what do you recommend for front skinnies for a daily? I run NT Tri 5 R2s on Demon Wheels. I would go with the same ones that I'm running. It's the Mickey Thompson SR um, 28 by 6 on a 5-inch wide wheel. And those are 18 inches, 18-inch wheels. And with that, guys, I'm going to check out. If I didn't get to you, sorry about that. But we are coming up on two and a half hours. And I think my throat's about to come out. My larynx is about to take the rest of the night off. So I want to thank each and every one of y'all for hanging out with us tonight. I love each and every one of y'all. Could not do this without you. If you're going to send it, don't bend it. Keep your shiny side up. Keep wearing your mask. If not for yourself, then do it for others. With that, it's a wrap. Stay safe out there. I look forward to seeing you on the next one. That's a wrap. Adios.